15th year of my life standing in front of the recruiting office looking at the sign. All I could see was that combat soldier running through them bushes. I had to be just like that. And then when I got there, I thought, what am I doing? So anyway, <laughs> y'all not mad, are you? Oh, praise God. We're going to have a good time today. I get to finish what I've been doing for several weeks. This is the period to it, so we get to finish. Let's go to the book of Luke and to the sixth chapter. And God is moving in a great way. He moves by the power of his word. And when you're gutsy enough to believe it and say it, you'll see God move the same way. People say, boy, if I'd have been the apostle Paul, you got the same God, same anointing. You got the words Paul wrote, use them. And just go for it and watch God move mightily. Amen. Praying for the sick, laying hands on them, seeing God minister to other people. And while you're going through troubles yourself, God still ministers to other people if you'll just pray for them and go for it. We're going to talk a little bit about that today because we've been talking about foundations and actually we've been talking about doing the word and faith. And in it, there has to be foundations laid. So we're going to read some scripture and talk about it from there. And if you found Luke 6, uh, we're going to go down to about verse 48 and we'll start there. Well, matter of fact, let me do 44. For every tree is known by his own fruit. I know it's a little recap from last week, but it's just about half of it. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Notice the tree is a his. It's his because when he talks about trees, he's talking about people. His own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart. He's talking about a good tree. Okay, a good man. Good treasure heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, he brings forth that which is evil, which is nothing but a devil without a D. And for of the abundance out of the heart, for the abundance of the heart, his, that tree, will speak. His tree will say what's in the abundance of his heart. There you go. Out of the abundance of that baby's heart, it speaketh. He said, feed me, Simo. You know I'm hungry. Oh, Lord. Anyway, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. That's why he went into the question. Your mouth is speaking. Why would you say, Lord, Lord? Why would you call me Lord, Lord? That means divine authority. It means no higher power. It means there's nothing that can supersede that word. He said, how can you acknowledge there's nothing any higher than me and you won't do what I say? As a matter of fact, this is where we got into uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, I know what I'm going to say is a little backwards to what you're usually hearing, but that doesn't mean it's not frontwards in what you should have heard. Are you all right? I don't mean to elaborate on the word GD by any means. I'm wanting you to get a revelation of what blaspheming, what taking the Lord's name in vain is to God, not to your parents and your grandparents and everybody around you. It matters what it means to Him. Are y'all all right? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Y'all hanging in with the first crowd because they wouldn't even talk to me. I must have made somebody up shot. They caught, when I was growing up, it was upshot. Now it's upset. Anyway, must have upshot them. And so when we hear the word GD, I'm giving you the initials. You're smart enough to know the cuss word that I'm speaking of. And so, and I wouldn't mind just saying it to make sure that you totally understand it. But some of you can't even handle an explanation. If you say it in church, like it's different than saying it in the parking lot. Because I know where the church is. And so if I say it in the parking lot, I said it in the church. Okay, we got that one down. So the GD thing is, like me, when I was in construction stuff, it was just nothing. I'm not being funny. I'm not trying to make the construction workers that built the Catawba project look bad. But let me tell you something. Man, 40 years ago when we were building that thing, I, it, everything was hand me a blank and hammer. Who put that blank in there? Where's that blank in this and the blank in that? And, the, and if you took the blank out, we wouldn't have much to say at all. And, and I'm not kidding. And, I mean, we didn't say GD when we was mad. 
I mean, they just, they'd be dragging a chain fall out of the game. But, uh, don't forget that GD sledgehammer. Oh, yeah, we're going to have that GD sledgehammer. All right, let's go. And see, nobody's thinking about God. Nobody's thinking about taking the Lord's name in vain. We don't walk with God. We don't really know God. We know about God. We know some of y'all love God. We know some preachers. And we know, we know that. But we're iron workers and we're hell raisers. And that's what we do. And this is how we talk. And we don't mean anything about God. I'm just explaining it. So in the midst of that, you go somewhere and you've got living like that. And you say GD and a believer hears you. What's the first thing that believer thinks? Listen to them, they over there taking God's name in vain. It gets them all upset. How dare they take God's name in vain. And I don't want to pop any bubbles here, but yes I do. But that's not taking God's name in vain. His name's not even in there. His name's not God. He is God, but that's not His name. And the way you take his name in vain is to take the nature of God in vain because a word name means nature. People were named all through the Bible according to their nature. They were called by their nature. Are you all right? There's no name any greater than the name of what? Jesus. And what does God hold above his name? The word. Now that's amazing. To think that there's nothing above the name of Jesus... And the only thing that's above the name of Jesus is God's word. God holds his own word above his own name. And his name reveals his character. And his word has still got a shiny cloth buffing it up on top of that. You're going, well, if GD is not, I know I just messed up your taking God's name in vain thing. I just messed it up because we all know it's GD. Do you, GD you probably ain't going to like this. I'm not condoning it. I'm not asking you to do this. But it means no more than saying dog food. I don't give a dog food. What you do with that? That's how powerful the GD word is. Now what is destructive is the truth about taking God's name in vain. Because if the church really had the revelation... Of what that is. Hearing GD wouldn't even bother you no more. You'd just think to yourself, they just need to get saved and get their mind renewed. They'll be okay. That's the way I was before I got saved. Don't you ever see people instead of condemning them? Don't you think to yourself, I was like that? I used to be that way. I said that it, I've been born again almost 40 years and I still, I still go, I was, it's just like the old atheist guy down there come. I am not a believer. I said, I totally understand. I used to be just like you. Instead of putting him down for the way he is, I can identify. Probably with about all of you. Amen? Now, where was I at? Somebody help me out. All right. Now, listen to me. Please hear me. Taking the Lord's name in vain is not a cuss word. Now look at somebody and say, you should not be cussing. Now I don't want anybody in here going and telling, oh, the preacher said it's okay to just say GD. Because people do that. They take what I say and turn it around. All the time. And now listen to me. Taking the Lord's name in vain is exactly what Jesus said. Why do you acknowledge there's no higher authority and you won't do what I say? When you look up taking the Lord's name in vain, it's when you do not do the word. Now the reason I can't get an amen on that because we would rather blame taking God's name in vain on the sinner that said GD. Not the Christian that won't obey God, but the sinner. He's taking God's name. I got news. There's no sinners out there taking God's name in vain. None of them. <gasps> Pastor, it's got to be the sinners. It can't be the Christians. Well, I don't miss us. It's us. You got the revelation. And taking God's name in vain is when you know the word and the revelation of it and it's time to act on it and you will not. You took God's name in vain. And what's so bad about it 
The GD guys were talking to each other, telling nasty jokes, laughing and saying, GD, while you're disobeying God. And guess what? God's not even paying them two guys any attention. Guess what he noticed? That guy's taking my name in vain. But no, 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 you wouldn't do that. You'd say, listen to them two people cussing. Now to be ashamed of them say, I cannot believe they talk like that. And in church too. Now, like that really, I don't know why the in church too is, you know, it's the same thing. Outside church, inside the church. It's the same thing. All right. Look at somebody and say, I am the church. Amen. First church of Larry right here. Hallelujah. Let me get some scripture. First Larry 1.1. Listen, you are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He lives and dwells and abides in people. You say, well, the ones I know you wouldn't know it. It only depends on the measure their mind's renewed. The measure your mind's renewed is the measure you minister. If you just got born again and all you know is you saved and you're excited and you tell people I got saved and they're not saved and they knock it and nail it and ask questions you can't answer, stuff you don't know about the Bible, you're just starting... I had all that happen to me, I, and I don't even know what's going on. Why is it when I was raising hell and doing drugs and cussing like a sailor or a soldier, how, how come when I was doing that, nobody said anything to me? But I quit, and I quit drugs, and I quit smoking, and I quit cussing, and I quit all this other stuff, and now all I'm getting is questions I can't answer and being told how ridiculous I am. How come when I was on my way to hell, I was such a great guy? And now that I have changed my roads and I'm traveling towards the heavenlies, there's something wrong with me. I think y'all can identify. And when you come into this, that's the way it seems. The Bible says we have not many fathers. It didn't say you weren't supposed to have many. It says you don't. You should have many fathers. It's talking about people that mentor you, speak into your life. People that cause you to change. Iron sharpens. What does that mean? That means somebody is going to have to be a file. And somebody is going to have to be the axe or the sword. That means that axe or sword is going to have to be put in a vice. Clamped down. Held safely. And here comes the file, the coarse one, like Kelly Varner, a prophet that is rough and tough and mean to the kingdom of Satan. Hello. And here he comes, and when he starts speaking the word, and it hits the edge of your sword or your axe, man, it's chunking off some metal. Little pieces of metal are going everywhere. That means you're having to get rid of some of you. The dull part. And the next thing you know, when they break that vice loose and pull you out, that other person that spoke into your life, that foul that was coarse and rough, kind of ticked you off when they said, who do they think they are? That was that word that brought you to the place to become sharp again. Iron sharpens iron. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? Somebody got to be the foul, and somebody's got to be dull. And when dull meets foul, foul goes to work, and dull becomes sharp. We all need to be filed. Look at somebody and say, you could use a good filing. You ever watch the woman with her fingernails? Man, if the body of Christ would treat their life like a woman does her fingernails, I got to go get my nails done. And that becomes the greatest priority I've ever seen in my life. You know, you wouldn't believe the stuff that I have to do so other people can go get nails done. Nail, I'm thinking your nails done. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I got a witness on that. I think you're right. I was looking forward to a good afternoon. God bless their nails. <laughs> They are so beautiful. Oh, I love them nails. Mm. By the way, it's good to have you in the service today, Mama Cat. That's Pastor Kathy to y'all. Hallelujah. I tell you, even when she's bandaged up, she's beautiful. Good. Grace, I better get off of that. You know, be wanting to be dismissing here in a minute. So, why would you call him Lord, Lord, divine authority, no higher power, and won't even do what he says? That's what he's saying. And that is taking the Lord's name, 
His name and his word are inseparable. God's word is as good as his name. His name's good as his word, but he exalted his word above his name. Now, there's nothing higher than his name. So when you step into the Word, you're stepping into the highest of all existence of the entire universe, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the direction of God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or if you will, just doing evil and ungodliness, has entered into the lives of people to the point that godliness is just literally blind to them. The Bible says that the world, their eyes have been blinded. And they'll stay blind until they see. It means revelation, not seeing with the natural eye. When they get a revelation, when they see, see what I'm saying, that means you got a revelation of it. If you can't see what I'm saying, it means you still don't understand what I'm talking about. See what I'm saying? (laughs) We do need to see. What we're saying. I need the revelation of what God is saying. I need to see it. That's why he said about dumb idols. They have eyes, but they can't see. They got a mouth, but they can't talk. He called them dumb idols. Dumb meaning they have no ability to speak or revelation. Well, so we, I'm not trying to get on the GD thing too much, but I have watched Christians, and I know Christians, if you want to call them Christians. But anyway, I'm just saying that they see people and when they cuss like that, they get so upset with a cusser in their presence and it doesn't even bother them. There's no conviction about not doing what God said. I I can't figure out why one person's cuss words drives you nuts and you not doing what God say wouldn't even bother you at all. A prophet, uh, Apostle Lewis Davis, was sitting in a board meeting and I just told him, I said, you know, I feel like the Lord give me this word to say, but this certain person is going to be there, and it's going to sound like I'm talking about them because what I've got to say identifies with them, not intentionally, not at all, but I knew what I was given to say, and now they're coming. And I'm like, well, if they come... Because I knew what happened in their life, they're going to think what I'm talking about to them is about them, and it's not. So I explained that. I said, I'm in a tight place. I said, I, the Lord told me to talk about this, and so-and-so has that problem, and he's coming. Now it's going to look like I'm about him, and that's not what I'm doing. I've never done that. I've never done that. And Pastor, Pastor Davis looked over at me and said, I ask you a question. That's the way he talked. I said, what is it? And he said, Pastor, if you ain't going to say what God said, say. What you going to say? I was sitting at the table with all my leadership, and all I could see was the person I was concerned about being offended. I had to measure them being offended or me throwing an offense towards my heavenly father. And I just said, well, I'll say what God said, say. So the next day when I had to say what God said, say, and they came walking in, I bowed my knee and I said, Father, let me say this with wisdom and discretion, and I thank you for guidance of your spirit. We should always look to the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in all that we do. And you might not know it, but if you don't know why you were created, the first reason was to worship Him. That's why you were created. Why was I born? To worship God. Because God is so into himself. I know it sounds selfish, but it is true. He's so into himself that he made man in his, no other likeness. His. Are you hearing me? Sounds selfish. No, his likeness. His image. Just like him. And then he took his spirit and breathed it into a body that was made in the image of who he is. And then that body now has the ability to speak Because he's in the image and likeness of God. Animals are in the image and likeness of dust. They can't talk. They don't communicate like we do. They don't have creative ability. Are you hearing me? They don't have an eternal soul. They have a short living soul. A lot of people think animals don't have a soul. It's a spirit they don't have. All animals have soul. Living beings have souls. Your feelings and your emotions. They have that. 
But the ability to think in words and communicate, they do not have that ability. That comes from God, and God gives it to his children. And his children are just like him. Even though he's superior, he is supreme. There is none like him. You're still the sons of God. And if you know who you're the sons of, then you are to know whatever your father said you can do, you can do what he said you can do. You can have what he said you can have. You can be what he said you can be. The thing is, is people are so consumed by the world and what it offers with its money and with its... People have no idea there's so many other ways to get things with God than the world's way, the easy way. And those ways are all booby-trapped. I don't know why folks don't believe that, but it's always been the truth and it's never changed. It's a booby trap. It's set up to suck you in. That whole tree of the knowledge of good and evil was to suck you in. That was the whole purpose of it. And it wasn't Eve's fault. It was Adam. It's the man. You'd be surprised what let rest on a man. Women are more free than they're blamed. Hello. Because Adam had the ability to cover the woman. And tell the woman to come away from the tree. He's the seed. He has the blood. And because he has the blood, that blood does not have a bad, negative, sinful nature. It's all of God. And he could have cleansed her, spoke the word over her, forgiven her, walked her away from that tree. And the sin nature would have never entered any of us. The reason it's in us is because Adam, our first father... He let that nature come in him, and it contaminated what? His blood. And that contaminated blood puts out sin. Sin in its nature doesn't have to be taught. You don't have to go to school. You don't need instructions. It has the ability within itself to manifest. You watched your children. You always taught them to tell the truth. You taught them right. And one day you ask them a little important question, and they bluntly lied, and you know it. And you're like, I can't believe My kid lied to me. They know that's wrong. Now who taught, Dale, who taught you to lie? Huh? Who taught you, boy? You learned that somewhere. Justin, did you teach him? You did? Just, I did, I did it. (laughs) So it just, it just comes naturally. (laughs) And that's the point. It does, it comes naturally. That's why when you did get caught and you throw that big, handful of cookies behind your back and the crumbs was on your lip and your jaw was puffed out and they go did you get in that cookie jar and you still won't give up you done stole you done disobeyed and now you're standing there caught and they go did you do that you you know it's amazing how we hang on to the death isn't it i remember my little son danny told me one time he said that's my story And I'm sticking to it. And I thought, where did you learn that from? So anyway, (laughs) and I'm sticking to it. But now that you know the difference between what taking God's name in vain is, now let's look at the foundation. How much? Oh, I got 13 minutes. Can y'all hold on that long? All right. Man, we got time today. And then he says, (laughs) whosoever, this is verse 47. Y'all know who whosoever is? A whosoever is you. Look at the person beside you and say, you are a whosoever. Yeah, that's you. Now we know who we're talking about. Whosoever comes to me, whosoever. That means you can look at somebody and laugh at them and go, look at them, they think they're approaching God. (laughs) Well, they're still a whosoever. And whosoever comes to him and hears his sayings and does them, Here's my what? Sayings, words. If you'll take these words and do them, I'm going to show you what you like. People that do the word is like a man that built his house. That word house, by the way, if you were to look it up, is a Greek word that if I pronounce it, I would crucify the way it sounds, but it means family. They just have the right. Matter of fact, I've noticed most of the places where it says house, it's family. They, it's just the King James translators, uh, which when I read the most of all of them, but that's what they say. He's like a man that built a house, a family. Watch what he did. Dig deep. Laid the foundation on a rock. I told you all about Duke Power and how we dug down and got so deep and got on that big rock to build that nuclear power plant. It'll stand two major earthquakes. How could something like that stand two major earthquakes? Because it is built on 
a rock. And he says, when the foundation of the rock, and when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently. It didn't say it might, it said it did. It beat vehemently upon that house, that family. That family took a licking. It says, and could not shake that family. Could not shake that house. Because it was founded on a rock. The word rock means revelation knowledge. It's founded on a revelation and the understanding of Christ. Because we just, well I'll show it to you in a minute. But he that heareth and doeth not. Would have been better off to have just said GD a thousand times. Wouldn't even been nowhere near as bad. If you'd just stand up and cuss and cuss and spit and kick dirt and cuss and cuss, nowhere near as bad as disobeying God. Oh well. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation. He built a house on the earth against the stream. Here it comes, same storm. The stream did beat vehemently. The difference is, it says the ruin of that house. It says, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Yeah, I guess you could say it was great, but it didn't get better. Woo! All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians, third chapter. Go to 1 Corinthians 3, and let's go to about verse 11. And he says this. And this is after him talking about that your house is God's husband area. It's where he lives. He built it. He's talking about your body. This is in the context of talking about God made you in his likeness and image. And he said, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid. He's talking about Jesus Christ has laid a foundation that no other man can lay. Let me make it simple. Jesus laid a foundation a man cannot touch. You'll never lay one like he laid. It is the most solid rock you could ever stand on. It is the most unmovable existence in the whole entire universe is the foundation that he laid. And he says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on this foundation, what foundation was that? Jesus Christ. All right? If you build on Jesus Christ, gold silver, and precious stones. Then he goes on with another three that are not quite as valuable. He says wood, hay, stubble. And then in verse 13, 13, standing for rebellion, it says every man's work shall be made manifest. Let me paraphrase that. If King James is hard on you, let me give you Carolina Avenue talk. God going to check you out. He's going to check you out. For a day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, I didn't say that. God did. And then he said, if any man's work abide that he's built thereupon, that man's going to receive what? He receives a reward. But if your man's work shall be burned, he's going to serve a loss, but look at the grace and the love and the awesomeness of God. But he himself shall be saved, yet so, as by fire. So know you not that you are the temple. See, the context of this is you're the temple of God. You are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. You were born and created in the image and like I know I always hear somebody go, but I did not ask to be born. Well, I've got good news. You won't have to ask to die. So you broke even. Didn't ask to come, didn't ask to go, and so you're now even. All right, so are y'all all right? <laughs> it is a good one. I'm missing original. First Larry 1-1. One, one. Now watch this one. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Don't let a man be deceived. 
himself. Don't deceive yourself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, then let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it's written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they're vain. Therefore, don't let a man glory in men. For all things are yours. Whether you be Paul or Apollos or Cepheus, or the world or life or death, or things present, or things to come. Watch this. All are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Now here's what he said. He said, your body is a temple. You are of Christ. Christ is of God. So now here's God, and that's the order of it. He created a vessel. He put you in his likeness and image in it. He put Christ in it. He puts himself in it. And that one same self temple is now full of the Holy Ghost. Where that temple used to be full of other stuff. Now it is full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and God are inseparable. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are inseparable. It's like you. You first, the the Bible teaches us that we're a spirit. We have a soul, and we live in a body. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, he said, And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, that's W-H-O-L, okay? Your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless till the coming of the Lord. Now, that's two comings, by the way. That's the one that's the revelation knowledge of God. That is a coming of the Lord. When you get a revelation... That's the Lord coming to you. It's a coming, okay? And then there is a literal, real, true, flesh, bona fide, physical, literal return of the Lord in the earth. And it's likened unto the day 2,000 years ago when he left. When he rose from the dead, it woke up all the dead, and they got up and walked the streets, and he ascended up. The angels said to 500 brethren standing there as witnesses, told those 500 people, and to say, why are you standing here gazing? The same manner you see him going, he's coming back again. So I know he's coming back. But I know when he comes back, if his leaving raised the dead, what do you think his coming back's going to do? I'm telling you, you're going to see the greatest resurrection of all time. I mean, when he comes back, it ain't going to be obvious uh, by just seeing somebody in the sky. You're going to look around and all the dead's going to be getting up, praise God. The dead in Christ shall rise what? First, and we'll be the first ones on the scene, first one knowing what's going on, and everybody else that's alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I mean, as quick as your eye can sparkle, your normal flesh, you won't even have to ever go to the funeral home. You'll just go from being natural to supernatural. You'll just be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And when it says, and then we shall meet the Lord in the air, or to go study that verse. Man, that's one of the best ones. Meet the Lord in the air means the breath of God. It means that in one word when he speaks that we're all going to be totally transformed. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? Now we hear that word meet the Lord in the air and without studying, the Bible says, he said study, show yourself, approved that you'd be a workman that needs not be ashamed. Are you all right? A lot of people read it. We're going to meet the Lord in the air and they think a bunch of little fat white babies with blonde hair and harps is going to be sitting on clouds floating around and you're going to pop up down one of them clouds and they're going to play music to you and we're going to have a meeting with the Lord up there. Well, I mean, that's fine. It's not ungodly. Praise the Lord. But when you find out it's a whole lot bigger than that, it's a whole different picture. And don't you know that the devil loves people thinking that you're floating on clouds with little fat white babies? (laughs) I couldn't help but get tickled at you. I couldn't help but get tickled at her. She's, she's going, yeah. She's sitting there picturing all them little white babies floating around her on that cloud. This can't be heaven. It just can't be. So, but, <laughs> honey, I feel the same way. I'm a white man, and I'd be going, well, this is it? Anyhow. <laughs> but we get this image of stuff of God that, that through all these centuries that man is 
you got to understand, a lot of this stuff came when they didn't even know that the world was round. Hello. They thought that there was a light bulb going around a flat earth. The whole world thought that. The whole world was convinced it was flat. They all knew it was flat. Matter of fact, when people started coming up with the theory that it was round, they were the dingiest people you ever met. They put them out. Them people crazy think the world's round and spinning and going around. And it's funny. You're sitting there knocking it, and it's the truth. All right, well, the same way it was with people in older days, not having the revelation of how the universe is functioning, People are like that in their Bibles. They're born again, love God, and going to heaven. But it's, to them, the world's still flat. Then <laughs> people think it's round. And the church goes around acting like that about scriptural and biblical things. And the truth is, so much of it, you need the revelation. It's not flat like you've been thinking. This thing is round. <gasps> it can't be round. That means my grandma lied. Oh, she was just taught that it was flat. And I mean... Yeah, you, you just got to understand that just because grandma taught it, that don't mean you have to have bought it. I love the story that I've heard told so many times in preaching. This is old to you, I know. I know, but it makes so much sense. But it's a story about a question that came up to a woman while she was cooking this big old roast and said, why do you cut the butt off of that roast before you cook it? Oh, she said, well, my mama always cut the butt off. So, oh, I'll go ask her. So he went to her mama and said, why do you always cut the butt off of that roast? She said, because my mama, she always taught me that. She said, well, that's, that's grandma. Let's go talk to grandma. So they went and asked grandma. They said, why in the world do you cut the butt off of that before you put it in the pot? And she says, well, actually, my mother taught me that. Well, she was still alive. She was like 98. I said, that's great-grandma. Let's go ask her. So they went, great-grandma, why you always cut the butt off before you stick it in the pot? She said, oh, that. She said, well, my pot wasn't but so big, and that rose always had that big butt on it, so I cut the butt off so it would slide down in my pot. So now you know why you cut your butt off. You see what I'm saying? And we, we think that because... Well, that's what we've always heard. That's the way that it is. Stupid stuff. I remember when I was a kid, this really shocked me because I didn't know what it was talking about, but I, it's going to probably make my wife embarrassed. But I, I remember hearing the statement, it's better for a man to spill his seed on the ground. Now let me see if y'all know the rest of it. Yeah, that's exactly what it said. Who else knows what it says? It's better for a man to spill his seed on the ground than... No, it's better for man to spill his seed. Let's see. Better for man to spill his seed on the ground, yeah, than in the belly of a... It, they say whore, but it'd be prostitute, whatever. Now, you, you sounds like, oh, is that what the Bible says? But that's not in the Bible. There's so much stuff that's just not in there that people say, and you actually believe that it is. You know? There's people that believe... Uh, Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. They think that's scripture. Oh, well, let me move on. I know you're messing with somebody now. You're going, oh, you mean it's not? No, it's not. We must stick our nose in this word, and we must learn this word. Can I get an amen? Our foundation's in him. I'm out of time, so i got to find a place to close. All right. Let me give you this, because this is why I wanted to tell you this. Can I have a few more minutes? Y'all really don't mind? If you're that hungry, just go and miss this part. Here we, get, here we go, verse 12. If any man builds on this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, those are the three valuable elements. The other three are not so valuable, wood, hay, and stubble. But I looked up the meanings, and I want you to listen to the meanings of these words. Talking about the foundation of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the power of the blood. Are y'all out there? Man, stuff, I can say it and get cold chills. Glory to God. And so he says, the foundation of gold, that's prayer. Gold stands for prayer. And then he said, silver. And I love what silver stands for. Fasting. Don't y'all like to fast? I don't talk about it much, but I have my own kind of fasting. And I do a lot of one meals. And every once in a while I'll do one day. And then I'll do three days. 
And it's been a long time since I've done 21 days, but I've done 21 days a few times. I'll usually be about 30 or 40 pounds heavier, and then after the fast, I'm down at the correct weight. But since I wasn't trying to lose weight, I get right back up real quick when the fast is over. Amen. But fasting is good. I've never fasted that long without water. I always drink water. The only time that you can fast without food and water is when you get a God-called Holy Ghost fast and he pulls you out. You will not be hungry and you will not be thirsty. But if you're going to intentionally fast and you're going to go three weeks and you do not drink water, you will dehydrate and you will have problems if the Lord did not tell you to do that. Can I have an amen? All right. So gold is prayer. Silver is fasting. Now, Precious stones. I bet y'all know what that is. You got to know what that is. That's giving. Now stop and think about it. A person that prays and fasts and gives. That's the nature of God right there. That's the whole nature of God. But it's the wood, hay, and stubble that will trip you up. Because if you're building on that foundation, you got to remember fire is going to test it. And when you throw silver and gold and precious stones in a fire, guess what the fire consumes? Only the dust that surrounded it. It will not harm it. And then he says, wood, hay, and stubble. Well, <laughs> wood is for weak. Weakness. And how many of you know wood is flammable? So when the fire comes, ought to be a simple test. And then hay is temporary. It means temporal. Wood, hay, weakness, Temporary and stubble. Oh, you don't want stubble. Look at somebody and say, you don't want to be stubble. Stubble. Do you know what stubble is? Stubble is stuff that doesn't matter. Now, you can build on that foundation, prayer and fasting and giving, or you can turn around and be weak and temporal and not matter. When the fire comes... When the test comes to your house, your house, when it comes, that fire is going to consume everything that's wood, hay, and stubble. And if the revelation knowledge of God is wood, hay, and stubble, guess what's going to get burnt? If the revelation in your life of God is silver and gold and precious stones, what's going to happen when that fire comes? Nothing. It will not consume anything that is of God. It only consumes what's of the world. God's, all the things of God they do not perish. They are eternal. Even you are eternal. If you commit suicide today thinking you're stepping out of your problems, you're still eternal. You still exist. And you're going one place or the other. Are you all right? And I didn't get to get into the compassion, but we as the body of Christ have got to learn to release more compassion than we do. God is more compassionate and forgiving than people. David said, Turn me over to God and let him judge me, for he shall be more merciful than man. God is not worse in judgment on you than a man. He's better. Whatever the world would do to you with your sins and your wrongs, God wouldn't. But we like to use God as the reason you're being so beaten and justify your... Oh, it's terrible. God loves us so much. It doesn't matter what our sins are. If you believe in same sex or if you believe that stuff that think, people think pervert, God still just, he just loves them. And he knew they were going to be that way or you and I were going to be that way before we was born. He loved us so much. I wish I could really put this in liquid and pour it in you because the fact that God loved us so much that before we ever did anything, he went ahead and paid the price Knowing we were going to do these things. Knowing you were going to lie. Knowing you would commit adultery. Knowing you'd take his name in vain. Knowing that you'd do this and that. He still, still paid that price. And it was silver and gold and precious stone. It wasn't wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. All right, well, I'll have to let you guys go on my time. I know you, but at least I finally got to finish do the word. The reason that, this part was at the end of doing the word or in faith is because people believe that a lot of it is just cussing and that I'm, don't misunderstand me. Now, I'm not telling y'all God doesn't care if you cuss. I think he does, 
But it's not always a heaven and hell issue, but it's got a lot to do with mature and immature issues. If you're a cussing, it might not send you to hell, but probably most people think you're going. That's all. I'm, I'm very serious. You're going to be shocked at the people that you see in heaven because of the gra- that song we sang about, about grace, what it does for you. It was so true because the song, I'd never heard that song and we didn't play it in the first service. I had them skip it for time's sake. I had no idea that it, the songs and the words was tied up with what I was preaching. Goodness and mercy, if y'all were singing the song, if anybody's watching me, you saw me walking around looking behind while I was dancing, I was looking behind. I got tickled. Rebecca checking me out. She thought I was looking at her all that time. And I'd, but you know what? I, what was I saying? Could you hear me? You could hear me through all that noise. I better watch it. You could hear that. I was saying, goodness and mercy is following me. And while we were singing that song, I was running around with that tambourine. I go, wow, look, here come goodness and mercy. I can't get rid of them. Oh, here come goodness and mercy. And that's the way it is. And when bad stuff happens in my life, if I'll just be patient, every once in a while one of my sons have to go, now, Dad, now, you the one all the time talking about saying stuff positive. Now, I listen to you, Dad. And I go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, thank you. You ever had your children correct you? Wait till they're in their 40s. Anyway, that's the whole thing, is just bringing us to a place that we use common sense with God And understanding the kingdom of God is not ridiculous, silly. It's not a bunch of floaty little stuff and weird sounds and odd people. It's not the people that just roll their eyes back and jerk and buck and make. I'm going to stop and think about it. I'm not knocking anything. But let's communicate in our discharge in here. Because it's happened to me. What I'm talking about, I've done it. But I've never just been in a service to get attention. I told her, I said, I will never, I'll never go out in the spirit as they call it. I think it's fake. I think that they've fallen down or that guy's pushing them. There's something funny about this. And so I'm ushering in a meeting for Kenneth Copeland, and he calls me out while I'm ushering. And and what's wild about it, and I'll close on this, is I saw it with my back turned to him. One of my first real wild experiences. And I'm holding an offering bucket, getting ready to pass it. And I've got it. He's way behind me on a platform. My back's to him. And I saw him point at me and say, you, come here. And just like that. And I saw it. And it startled me to the point that I actually turned around and looked at him. And when I turned around and looked at him, he said, you, come here to me. And it was wild because I thought I done seen this twice. I'm serious. So I went walking up there. It was a good little walk down that aisle. I was working hard up in the high section, nosebleed. And I got up there. And he laid his hands on me and started prophesying to me. And I'm t- my body, it caught on fire. I mean, it bur- I have never, even to this day, had that experience. It was a fire, heat, burn with no pain. And it was hot. And I remember thinking, how can you be this hot and not feel pain? And it just melted me, literally. I just started buckling. And then I fell down. On my knees. Everybody else fell backwards. I was so rebellious that I went straight to my knees. And I was on my knees for just a minute. And I was starting to get drunk in the spirit. And I saw everything getting blurred. I'm serious. People were getting blurred. And I was like, what is happening to me? And then I fell forward and landed on my face. Didn't hurt. Didn't catch myself with my hands. I literally fell forwards. Now you picture your pastor on his knees. And then he falls forward. I'm on a platform high as this. The whole world's looking. I'm the man that ain't never going out. You ain't knocking me down. And then I fell forward and I could see everybody. And my face was laying on the floor. And I couldn't move. My hiney was in the air. My, you know what I'm talking about. My knees are down. It's like bending over and laying your face on the floor. Now my rear's sticking up in the air. My face is on the floor and there's 5,000 people. Staring at me. Mr. Ain't never going to do it. And so I'm up there looking at him. And all I can hear is a repeat of the prophecy that he just gave me. 
I can remember that thing to this day. He said, not many days long gone by, you're going to be completely freed of all debt of all kind. He'd been to prophesy how I had been given and given and given, and now it was the time of return and harvest. He began to talk about how he was going to bless us and bring it back. And he said, in the anointing that's on my servant, that was Kenneth Copeland talking, the Spirit of God speaking to him. He said, in the anointing that is on my servant, which is Kenneth, he said, I now release on you. You now have the same anointing for signs and wonders and miracles, and you are going to be a blessing unto many. He went on and on. And my body was on fire, and I was just melting. And that was like a day of getting born again. It's like I was born again, again. Because I got out of that situation and got in the car going home, and I was so jacked up, so fired up, God had touched me, burned me, cleansed me, and done something in me that the natural flesh can't touch. I mean, man, nothing can touch this experience with God. And that one experience with him, and that was December the 1st, 1979. 8.30 in the evening. The Spirit of God calls me out, burns me up, lays me out in front of people. But when I got up and went back out about my business, I had an anointing on my life like I'd never heard. A boldness like I'd never had. It's nothing for me to kick a door open in any store or anywhere I went and holler, praise God. I know you hear people do that and you think, oh, he's just immature. But I tell you what, I was so fired up, nothing mattered but God. Everywhere, I even had people say, you know, he's a little fanatic. If you're going to be one, it ought to be about God. Because you can't be fanatical enough about the one that's more than enough that's your provider and your healer and your deliverer the one that gave you an expected end the one that said don't cast down your confidence because you got a great recompense of reward coming to you honey I'm talking about the one that set me free renewed my mind and touched my wife gave me a wonderful woman y'all don't know how mean she used to be until she got saved hallelujah and I don't want her to backslide she'll kill me God's a good God. Let's all stand up on our feet. Glory to God. We serve an awesome and mighty God whose blood is so powerful that it cleanses us all the way to our soul, down to our toenails, man. You are free. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. Will you just receive it? You, I, all you have to do is accept it. And you go, well, but I couldn't really live a Christian life. No, you can't. I can't either. Oh, what are you talking about? I'm talking about accepting him who does live it and let him move in you. And he will start living it through you. He's not expecting you to be as wise as he is. He's expecting you to step into that wisdom and let that wisdom get in you and you watch what he does because you're the ground and he's the seed and when he plants it you can't help but grow it it's going to come out it's going to grow if you plant it it's going to grow good or evil if you plant it it will grow amen now look at somebody and say plant good grow good yeah if you plant good you have a good harvest if you don't plant good when your harvest comes, you need to pray for a crop failure. I don't know if you got faith for that, but you need a crop failure. Amen. Say this with me, everybody. If you're a visitor, if you're a pastor, a deacon, even if you're the bishop of the West Coast, I want you to say this with me, everybody, out good and loud too. Say, oh God, I ask you now, forgive me of all sin. Cleanse my heart. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. That makes me whole again. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. I confess that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead to justify me. And I receive it in Jesus' name. Woo, glory to God. Can you say amen? Amen. Well, my wife's got an announcement to give you before you go. And if you was just wondering, man, he sounded like a Baptist today. Well, I'm wearing my daddy's suit. And he died 31 and a half years ago. And his suit's been around a while. And I usually don't wear it unless I do funerals or weddings. And so I just got it out this morning. I just felt that Baptist spirit come on me when I got to thinking about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and that resurrection. Oh, glory be to God. Let me say, I pick on Baptists a lot, but let me tell you what I love about them. 
that get you saved. Look at somebody and say, yes, they will. I'd like to pray for a great friend of ours this morning if our media person, is that Art up there? Well, way to go, Mr. Art. Put Liz Sharp up there for me. A great friend of ours, Dr. Elizabeth Sharp, will be competing in the Senior Olympics this upcoming week. I want you to see her picture. She is an associate and an armor bearer to Dr. Clarice Fluitt. She was a military police in the Army and represented the Army in the Olympics back sometime back there, okay? But uh, I would guess Liz is probably in her 70s, and she has released her faith to win three gold medals in her entry divisions. Uh, what is it, June the 9th through the 11th? The details are in your bulletin, but I want you to see this extraordinary woman of God. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if you got her on your side, Boy, you got God and her, you will win. I'm going to tell you that right now. But she is an extraordinary, beautiful, just a anointed woman in many, many ways. We'll, we'll have her back here soon. And what a musician she is. She can create an atmosphere for God to perform miracles on the keyboard. I mean, just make, make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. But stretch your hands out towards the uh, picture up here. Father, in Jesus' name, we release an anointing upon our friend, Dr. Elizabeth Sharp, and we send her forth with all of our armies to excel in her body, in her competitions, and to cause her to bring home the gold in Jesus' name. We are in agreement with you, Liz Sharp. You can do this. We are going to do it with you in the spirit and in prayer, and we look forward to hearing your victory speech in Jesus' name. Amen and and amen. She is a true patriot. She created a beautiful video. I wish we'd have played it on Memorial Day, but we'll play it for you real soon. But she is an extraordinary woman, and I, can't, I could talk about her for 10 minutes, but I won't. God bless you. Have a great week, and go do the Word. Hey.